In September 2019, Ubisoft is launching their game subscription service with a free trial that will last from the 3rd to the 30th of September. This trial doesn't sound quite as free if you follow their asterisks to the fine print. To begin free trial, you must provide a valid credit or debit card. You'll be charged the full amount of the subscription price, $14.99 US or Euro per month, on expiration of the free trial on October 1st, 2019, unless you cancel before September 30th at 11.59 p.m. Caution is advised if you decide to participate in this trial, unless you don't mind paying the subscription fee. What do you get for $14.99? Access to over 100 games that supposedly include fan favorites and the hottest upcoming releases. Furthermore, Uplay Plus is advertised to offer access to the premium editions, which include DLCs and additional content. While this may at first glance seem like good value, reading the fine print might sour your initial impression. Premium editions versus standard editions, where applicable. Editions included in Uplay Plus may not include all premium content, offer subject to change. Oh dear. This is the shield Ubisoft will point to if they ever sequester DLCs for a more expensive subscription or sell premium passes as a separate product. We did say the offer is subject to change. We did warn the additions included in Uplay Plus may not include all premium content. This is not baseless cynicism. The former has some precedent. In January 2016, EA launched Origin Access for $5 a month. This subscription provided a 10% discount off anything in the Origin store and access to the games in the vault, which at the time included the Dead Space series, Dragon Age franchise, Sim City, Sims 3, Battlefield 3, 4 and Hardline. The subscription also provided limited time early access to games before release. Side note here, early access is a euphemism to describe delayed access for everybody else. Actual early access is beta and alpha testing, which is not an experience most players are likely to enjoy since alphas are by definition buggy and unstable. Betas have been redefined to now mean pre-release demos. For an example of how Origin Access early trial worked, let's look at the launch of Battlefield 1 back in 2016. Play first trial began on 13th of October, a week before the game's actual launch on 21st of October. The trial gave you 10 hours of game time, but you didn't get access to the full game. Five maps and four modes were available. Conquest, Rush, Operations and Domination. You also got a taste of the single-player campaign, with the missions Storm of Steel and Through Mud and Blood. As with other EA and Origin Access trials, your Battlefield 1 progress carried over if you bought the full game after the trial ended. How lovely! Pay $5 a month to play a time-limited demo so EA can convince you to spend $60 to keep the game. Wasn't that the point of the open beta? Battlefield 1 was eventually added to the vault, meaning Origin Access subscribers could play it as long as their subscription was active. But there's a catch. None of the DLC packs are included in the subscription, cutting subscribers off servers that host these maps. EA solved this problem in 2018 by introducing a higher tier, Origin Access Premiere, at a more expensive $15 a month. Premiere offers unlimited early access to new releases and also includes most DLC. How does it work with games that don't have map packs or season passes? Let's look at Battlefield 5 for an example. These are the exclusive perks Premiere offers over the cheaper service. Five sets of paratrooper outfits. Customize your soldiers with five special soldier sets for British Special Air Services and German Airborne Troops. Deluxe Edition Special Assignments. 20 weekly items with airlift, each containing one customization item. By introducing this higher tier, EA demoted the original service to Origin Access Basic. This could inspire other publishers to segment their subscription services into multiple tiers. Premium subscription to play premium tier games, or early access to latest titles or DLC. Just like now, we have pre-order to get early access to the beta. This will, of course, lead to subscription to the service. Then pay extra to play the games you want. Which will then inevitably lead to, hey gamers, instead of paying for the service and then paying to play each game, 
Subscribe to the extra exclusive Super Premium package and pay just one low price each month to play all your games whenever you want. No restrictions. All titles will be available to you forever. But only while you're subscribed and only to the titles up to whatever date we choose. Future titles? Eh, we may once again charge an extra fee. Premium subscriptions will entice gamers with garbage like exclusive avatar and banner to show others how awesome you are because you pay more for the same shit. Character. Battle passes and season passes will be extra and or tied to the player's subscription tier. Base subscription, base season pass. To get the season pass with the sparkly gold skin, you need the sparkly gold subscription. Of course, this is speculation. For a contemporary example, the language used in the terms and conditions of Uplay Plus allows Ubisoft to implement the same segmentation. On the other hand, Uplay Plus is already launching at $15, the same price as EA's most expensive Premier Access. This may make a higher tier of Uplay Plus unlikely, but that doesn't preclude Ubisoft from excluding premium content like their terms specify. What might the pricing look like for a game that is exclusive to the subscription that does not include all premium content? Players may have to buy the DLC or Season Pass separately even while they are subscribed to play the base game. In this scenario, DLC buyers will be chained to the subscription service or risk losing access to the premium content they paid for. This is already the case with Xbox Game Pass, which might provide a precedent for other publishers to point to. To be fair, both Uplay and Microsoft currently allow you to purchase games with a single payment, though that doesn't guarantee they will continue to give you that choice forever. Uplay Plus has already set terms that hint at this possibility. Like Uplay Plus, EA offered a number of trials to entice players into subscribing to Origin Access, first in 2017 and twice in 2018. Like Uplay Plus, EA's free trial carried the same caveat. After the trial, the current Origin Access monthly or annual membership fee will be billed, cancelled during the trial period without charge. Gotta love how these billion dollar corporations stoop to such shady practices. Come try our service for free. Oops, you forgot to cancel your service during the free trial. Guess we have to charge you the full fee now. The intuitive policy would have consumers lose access after the free trial's conclusion with a prompt asking if they'd like to retain access by paying the subscription. You might ask, what is the problem with all this? You might even say this doesn't matter. Don't like it? Don't subscribe to it. I like having the option to play all the games I want for a month. We can still buy the games to keep. Do you think you will always have that choice? Sure, Uplay Plus is launching as an alternative. Now, subscriptions have always been introduced as an option to avoid alarming players. Uplay Plus is going a step further by launching with a free trial. While many might come away thinking this subscription offers good value, services like these may be hiding a sinister purpose. While subscriptions always launch as just another option, they may be laying the groundwork for the transition to a new business model. Case in point, Origin Access Premiere already allows exclusive early access to new releases, which actually means delayed access for everybody else as we've explained earlier. How long before exclusive early access becomes exclusive access? How long will it be before subscriptions are the only way to play new games? Some might say we're being paranoid. Why would the industry want this? Why would they want to move away from charging $60 for AAA titles? Subscriptions guarantee sustained revenue, regardless of popularity of new releases. This will insulate publishers from financial losses if their games fail to capture interest. Consumers are not likely to unsubscribe just because of their anticipated title's failure, since they might enjoy other games the subscription offers. Subscriptions do not preclude publishers from fleecing their customers with microtransactions and time savers. Just look at World of Warcraft, selling character boosts for $60. World of Warcraft requires $15 every month, $50 for launch access to new expansions, and yet Blizzard had the nerve to sell a level boost for $60. If Blizzard can get away with it, EA and Ubisoft will certainly try. Furthermore, subscriptions will make it easier for publishers to kill servers for older titles. EA is particularly prone to this practice having killed multiplayer services for several games including Dark Spore, Crisis 2 and classic Need for Speed titles such as Most Wanted, Underground 2 and Pro Street as well as the vast majority of other sports titles. Character. While this is bound to irk players who bought these games, 
subscribers won't notice much as they will still have other games in the library they're paying for. It would appear players don't mind the cost of subscriptions. Just look at the number of people giving away titles they receive from their Humble Monthly subscription, instead of, say, unsubscribing. Humble Monthly was one of the first digital game subscriptions, having launched in October 2015. These bundles do feel a bit shady, as only one or two of the games included in each delivery is specified. Subscribers are deliberately kept in the dark about the majority of the games they will get. On the other hand, Humble Monthly is one of the very few services that allow their customers to keep the games they get even after they unsubscribe. This is not the case with most other subscription services. Your access will be revoked as soon as your subscription expires. How will publishers enforce this going forward? Always online DRM? Sure, you might rightly point out most of the single-player games offered now can be played offline. But these games were developed before publishers started pushing subscriptions as a standard business model. Consequently, these games were designed for the traditional buy-to-play business model. This may not be the case for titles developed in tandem with the advent of subscription services. Look at Beyond Good and Evil 2 for a glimpse of the future. We wonder if its always online DRM has anything to do with Uplay Plus, since its persistent connection requirement fits perfectly with the subscription model. How, you might ask? You pay a monthly fee to access the game. The DRM will regularly, if not continuously, check the status of your subscription. If the publisher's servers tell the DRM your subscription has lapsed, you will no longer be allowed to play the game. You might ask why can't publishers enforce subscriptions without Always Online DRM? Piracy Without Always Online DRM, players might download all single-player titles available in the subscription and then crack them to work without checking the license. Hell, pirates might not need to subscribe even once to get their games, since scene groups will do that for them and bundle the game with their crack as they do now and always have done. DRMs like Denuvo might delay the release of a crack, but pirates may be able to bypass even these. How? One of the earliest techniques pirates used to get around Denuvo was having someone who bought the game log into his account and download the game on the pirate's machine. This would activate the game on the pirate's machine, though this only lasted a few days. Once the game was installed, the pirates would then disconnect their internet while they were still on the buyer's account and play until their installation was deactivated. This was called the Felix method and wouldn't work if the game cannot be played offline. This is what publishers tried to target with Always Online DRM. Though consumer backlash has thankfully impeded its widespread adoption as the industry standard. Why are consumers so opposed to it? Always Online DRM is fundamentally incompatible with the buy-to-keep business model that players are accustomed to. Games that require a persistent connection to the developer's servers will one day become permanently unplayable, denying buyers the product they pay to play in perpetuity. This is not the case with subscription services, since subscribers know they only retain access while their membership is active. The advent of subscriptions will desensitize gamers to losing access to their games. We might even stop thinking there are games, since we won't be paying for perpetual access anymore. This is what makes subscriptions the next stage in the evolution of games as a service. Subscriptions, along with the aforementioned Always Online DRM, exemplify the industry's goal to maximize the level of control they retain over your access to the products after you pay for it. The more control they exert, the more revenue they can extract. While each subscription might be affordable, the cost could quickly add up. Look at Origin Access Premier, $15 a month to access EA's full library, and then some. Pay for it all again with Uplay Plus, Xbox Live Gold, PlayStation Plus, if you're a console completionist. Then World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV if you're into that sort of thing. Epic, Bethesda, Rockstar, Square Enix, if and when they launch their own subscriptions. Will we have cross-play between the platforms? Once subscriptions become ingrained as a new normal, the inevitable imposition of a persistent connection requirement will feel natural. Obviously, you need to be connected to download the games you subscribe for. Will become, obviously, you need to be connected to play the games you subscribe for. And just remember, you're paying a subscription to gain access to their service not to the games. What these companies actually offer in their services can change at any moment. This progression has some precedent. 
the dominant console of this generation to be precise. When Sony launched PlayStation Plus in 2010, they assured players this subscription was just an option. The current PlayStation Network features will remain free. We are still very committed to PSN as a free, comprehensive entertainment service and are certainly not planning on reducing this service following the launch of PlayStation Plus. This promise didn't quite hold up to the test of time since Sony made a PlayStation Plus subscription mandatory for multiplayer when they launched the PS4 in 2013. In doing so, Sony brought their practices in line with their competitor Microsoft, which requires players purchase an Xbox Live Gold membership for $60 a year. This is the justification Sony gave when imposing this requirement. Considering the cost, to try to keep such a service free and consequently lower the quality would be absurd. No, that isn't absurd. What is absurd is paying the console manufacturer $400 for the console, paying the publisher $60 for each AAA game, paying your internet service provider for your connection only to have the manufacturer hold multiplayer hostage behind yet another payment. Why do gamers put up with this? Because Sony and Microsoft provide online infrastructure for multiplayer matchmaking? Valve and GOG offer the same service with Galaxy and Steamworks. And you don't see them forcing players to pay an additional fee to use the multiplayer functionality of the game you've just bought. We decided that if that's the case, then it would be better to receive proper payment and continue to offer a good service. Steam and GOG offer a perfectly good service, and they don't charge a penny. Sure. These stores keep a cut of the revenue, but so do console manufacturers. Forbes estimated console manufacturers keep $7 from every $60 purchase. Furthermore, Forbes reported Sony charges additional fees to use its Blu-ray DVD standard. This revenue was sufficient to keep multiplayer free on the PS3. How then could Sony justify milking their customers every month to access features of the games they've already paid for? Maintaining the quality, receiving proper payment, a more recent study from Superdata Research found console manufacturers receive 15% of the revenue from sales of PS4 and Xbox One games. Sony's justification rings hollow. Why do gamers put up at the hardware makers holding their games hostage? Loyalists might argue paying the fee isn't a big deal since the games you get are good value. But that is a matter of personal opinion. While we've primarily talked about Sony thus far, Microsoft was even worse. While Sony used the introduction of their PS4 to force players into subscribing for multiplayer, Microsoft went further and tried to curtail used games by introducing Always Online DRM with the launch of their Xbox One. This is what they said when they announced these restrictions. You can game offline for up to 24 hours on your primary console, or one hour if you are logged onto a separate console accessing your library. Offline gaming is not possible after these prescribed times until you re-establish a connection but you can still watch live TV and enjoy Blu-ray and DVD movies. That's not why I bought a console. A gaming console that couldn't play games offline. Brilliant! This alienated players who flocked to Sony's alternative PS4. Why did Microsoft turn potential customers away at the exact moment they needed to win them over? Why did Microsoft feel the need to impose an additional connection requirement when they already locked multiplayer behind their Xbox Live subscription? Perhaps we can glean the motive by looking at what impact the 24-hour connection requirement would have had, restricting access to single-player games, which their Xbox Live requirement hadn't encroached upon until that point. The only way Microsoft could profit from imposing this requirement would be absorbing single-player games into Xbox Live, thereby forcing players to pay an additional recurring fee to play single-player titles that have already been bought. To be clear, this is just our speculation but single-player subscription does seem to be the logical conclusion to Microsoft's initial proposals. Do you think this is the path Microsoft wanted to push on their platform? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. In any case, consumer backlash forced Microsoft to roll back their requirements just days after the initial announcement, but the damage was already done. PS4 had become the dominant console of this generation, due in no small part to Sony capitalizing on Microsoft's blunders. To be fair, Microsoft appears to have turned a new leaf, considering they have ported their first-party Xbox exclusives to PC first on their Windows 10 UWP storefront and then onto Steam. Furthermore, Microsoft's Play Anywhere initiative lets Xbox users play the games they've bought on PC through the Windows 10 store without requiring them to pay for it again. While PC gamers might not find this very useful, Play Anywhere could be a godsend for Xbox players dipping their toes in the PC gaming market. 
The forthcoming PC launch of Halo Master Chief Collection marks a welcome, if overdue, return to a platform Microsoft abandoned and neglected for a decade. Thankfully, Microsoft recognized and respected the traditional PC business model by not porting the requirement to subscribe to Xbox Live Gold for multiplayer gaming. The stark disparity between the console and PC platform was not lost on the Xbox community, one of whom pointed out the lack of logic in forcing Xbox users to pay for the same service. This is not likely to change since both consoles now require a recurring subscription. In fact, it could get even worse, since Sony is in a position to impose a persistent connection requirement with the PS5, like Microsoft tried with Xbox One. Sony has single-player exclusives gamers won't want to miss out on no matter what. In contrast, Microsoft titles are no longer Xbox exclusives, and in fact provide better value on the PC, as PC players don't need to pay the subscription fee to play the multiplayer versions of the games they buy. With that said, the subscription Microsoft is offering isn't half bad at the moment. At the time of making this video, you can subscribe to their Ultimate Games Pass for as little as $1 a month. The only problem I have with this is its transience. The store makes it clear it's a temporary discount from its original $15 a month. On the other hand, some might argue this is a lure to hook players into the subscription. But this is the whole point of this video, to warn players about the implication of the success of subscription services. While Microsoft seems to be making amends with the PC community, Ubisoft and EA have, in recent years, shackled their games with ever-increasing restrictions. It was EA that commissioned the development of Denuvo in the first place, while Ubisoft had the bright idea to pair it with VM Protect, performance be damned. What did they hope to achieve? Eliminate piracy? Did they succeed? Not quite. Sure, Denuvo does delay the release of a crack, but most of the titles that use it are cracked eventually. It is folly to assume these publishers will not ramp up their crusade against piracy. Subscriptions are the next stage in expanding their control over consumer access to their products. But this won't work as long as players can continue to choose to buy their games. It is hence reasonable to assume the industry will want to move away from the single purchase model and encourage players to subscribe. Hell, EA already does this by shoving Origin Access front and center every time you try to buy a game on their store. Want to play Battlefield 5? Join Origin Access Basic today for only $4.99 a month or $29.99 a year. Cancel anytime or even better, join Premiere today for $14.99 a month or $99.99 a year. Or not interested in joining today? Buy now for $59.99. How long will it be before you don't have that option anymore? Subscriptions are launching as an alternative to accustom players to their existence. This does not preclude the possibility of these services eventually becoming the exclusive avenue of access to their publishers' products. This will pave the way for the universal adoption of always online DRM across the industry, as players will, at that point, have lost all sense of ownership over the games they pay for, and hence will not complain about the restrictions they will be subject to. Would this be the final stage in the industry's war on piracy? Not by a long shot. As we explored in our analysis of always online DRM, there are two types, continuous authentication and server-side code. The latter is significantly worse than the former. With continuous authentication, most if not all of the game's code is stored on the user's machine. The game just regularly verifies its legitimacy with the developer's service and crashes the game if it fails to connect or authenticate. Assassin's Creed 2 is one example of a game that used this type of DRM, and it fell to piracy 48 days after its release. This scene could not have cracked Assassin's Creed 2 had Ubisoft reserved some of the code the game needed to function on their servers. This is the other type of always online DRM, delivering an incomplete product that is dependent on the developer's servers for code it needs to provide a functional experience. While the scene cannot crack these games to a standard that would satisfy their internal rules, this does not deter independent hackers and groups in the wider peer-to-peer -peer community. While the server-side code cannot be obtained, some have managed to emulate games like Diablo 3 and World of Warcraft to a functional degree, though this experience emulated on private servers can differ significantly from the retail game. Emulations are transient and hence less reliable than cracks since they are significantly more vulnerable to legal action. The most famous example would be Blizzard shutting down Nostalrius, a private server that emulated the original version of World of Warcraft. This is how they did it. We received a letter of formal notice from US and French lawyers, 
acting on behalf of Blizzard Entertainment, preparing to stand trial against our hosting company, OVH, and ourselves. How did Blizzard justify their takedown? Why not just let Nostalrius continue the way it was? The honest answer is, failure to protect against intellectual property infringement would damage Blizzard's rights. This applies to anything that uses World of Warcraft's IP, including unofficial servers. And while we've looked into the possibility, there is not a clear legal path to protect Blizzard's IP and grant an operating license to a private server. And not long after Blizzard shut down these private servers, they announced World of Warcraft Vanilla. This case serves as a glimpse of the future, a future where all games function like MMOs, even if they aren't massive or multiplayer. Emulation will be the industry's next target in their war on piracy. What would be their weapon of choice? Streaming services, like Google Stadia. These services eliminate the need or indeed option of installing the game on your machine. The lack of game files will make emulation impossible as there are no assets or code to work with. This will leave no avenue to play the game without paying for it. This is the holy grail the gaming industry has coveted for decades. A death blow for piracy. What does this mean for legitimate consumers though? Publishers might argue this shouldn't concern you if you're not a pirate. If you pay for your games like you're supposed to, you have nothing to worry about, right? Wrong. Streaming services present a number of challenges, requirements, and cost, most of which will be borne by the player. For one, streaming games will require a much faster and more reliable internet connection than what players can make do with today. For example, let's look at Battlefield 5's official system requirements. For competitive play, EA recommends 512 kilobytes per second internet connection or faster. That's half a megabyte every second. It would take an eternity to download the game on this connection. But once your game is installed, you would have no problem playing against other people if you were to trust EA's recommendation. Additionally, the speed of your internet connection does not determine the resolution you play at. You could play the game at 4K on the minimum 512 connection if you had the right monitor. This is not the case with streaming services. Again, let's look at Stadia for an example. You'll need at least 30, if not 35 megabits a second if you want to play at 4K. You can make do with 20 megabits if you only need 1080p. If your internet connection is any slower, you'll have to put up with 720p, which doesn't sound very appealing. The proposition only gets worse when you bring compression into consideration. It's highly likely the video will be compressed before it's streamed, which will make 720p on any service look significantly worse than 720p on your gaming rig. Internet speed is not the only issue here. Even if you had the best internet connection money can buy, latency will always be an issue as it is a function of distance. The distance between your device and the server you're streaming your game from is always greater than the distance between your CPU, RAM, graphics card and monitor. Consequently, lag will be significantly more noticeable on streaming services than on traditional PC. Furthermore, any downtime or disruption in the connection will immediately end gaming sessions though players have already been through this with Always Online DRM. However, they have always had other games to play until they were reconnected. It's uncertain if that will still be the case with the advent of streaming. Indie games might become the last bastion of offline gaming through platforms like GOG. This assumes indie developers will not be lured by streaming's immunity to piracy, though this looks unlikely considering many indie publishers have already made the deliberate choice to saddle their games with Denuvo. Even if these companies were interested in hosting their games on streaming services, they will lack the infrastructure to do so. We might see distribution platforms expand their service to meet this demand, in effect becoming content hosting providers. Smaller indie developers might need to pay certain levels of hosting fees depending on the hosting they need, much like website hosting now. Host server speed and bandwidth, player capacity and number of servers in various locations. It remains to be seen how their service will handle a surge in traffic, Will subscribers have to wait in queue for hours? Will they receive any discount to compensate for the inconvenience? These concerns might make it hard for Stadia, or indeed any other streaming service to win the hearts and minds of PC gamers, who have historically been served well by established venues and stores like Steam and GOG. It's reasonable to predict PC players will not turn to streaming their games unless they have no alternative. Unfortunately, they may not always have that choice. This is what gaming will become due to the adoption and evolution of games as a service. The industry has shown they will do whatever it takes, or rather, whatever they think it takes to maximize their control. Will gamers even care?
MMOs keep getting away with charging $15 every month. How long will it be before they start charging lapsed subscribers to store their progression? Secure your data. Let us safely secure your progress and rewards. Whatever happens, you can rest assured that your game saves will be safe. Game saves and progression will be deleted if subscription lapses for more than 30 days. Console manufacturers continue to get away with charging customers $10 every month just to play the games they've already paid $60 for with other buyers. Why do these practices still exist? Because we as consumers have done nothing to stop them. We keep paying into them and in doing so we foster policies that rob us of the concept of owning the games we pay for. Not the intellectual property, just the copy we purchase at the store. The advent of subscriptions is the last salvo in the industry's battle on our ownership of the products we pay for. If you don't see it as a weapon, it's because it hasn't started firing yet. We don't think of it as a threat because we still have other options, the avenues of purchase we've always had. Do you think we'll always have them? Did PlayStation players think in 2010 they'd have to buy PlayStation Plus in another three years? Heck, even when the subscription did become mandatory for multiplayer, most of them didn't mind as they thought the free games made it good value. History might repeat itself with subscriptions. In another decade, we might forget we once used to keep the games we bought. Player apathy and indifference is the greatest threat to consumer interests. So how can you help? Be cognizant of industry developments and think long and hard about what they mean for you, the gamer. Please help spread awareness of this by sharing this video. There is more content like this on the way, so please like, subscribe and press the bell button so you don't miss out. Several subscribers have reported that YouTube are screwing with their notifications, even when the bell button is enabled. So if that's true, just keep an eye out for our thumbnails. Help us, channel subscribers. You're our only hope. New videos will also be announced on Twitter, so please follow us over there too. Link is in the comments and the description below. We have a secondary channel we're using as a backup, just in case. So head over to there and like and subscribe that one too. While you're here, feel free to watch our analysis on Denuvo's history and performance impact, our analysis of Battlefield 5's controversies and our hardware analysis of CPUs and graphics cards.